Uh, so welcome to the uh, World Beyond War second annual conference. Uh, uh, as you know, the theme this year is War and the Environment. And uh, the idea of bringing, uh, of bringing the two activist groups together to uh, work on a common cause of saving the planet. Um, so as you're finding your seat, please, um, please try to move to the center of the aisle. Last night we had a very full house and it was very disruptive and awkward to have people climbing over and I know nobody likes to do that. Um, Okay, thank you. So um, it is my pleasure uh, to be moderating the first panel of the day. My name is Leah Bolger. And uh, the first panel is called uh, Understanding the Intersection of Pro-Environment and Anti-War Activism. And so um, what will happen is each of our three speakers will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have a good bit of time for question and answers. Okay, so our first speaker is Gar Smith. He is an award-winning investigative reporter and editor emeritus of Earth Island Journal. As co-founder of Environmentalist Against War, he has posted more than 20,000 articles and reprints on the EAW website. He is the author of Nuclear Roulette and the War and Environment Reader. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for all you uh, stubborn world changes for being, being out here at this event this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt to read this from my computer, uh, and I hope the batteries last as long as the speech. I'll try to make this as quick as I can. Uh, I'm here to uh, set the stage, and that means a little bit of uh, background on history of uh, war and nature. Uh, some of the details. War is humanity's deadliest uh, activity. From uh, 500 BC to AD 2000, history records show more than 1,000 documented wars. Uh, from um, the, in the 20th century, it has been estimated that uh, there have been 165 docu uh, documented wars, uh, which killed as many as 258 million people. That's more than 6% of the people that were born in the entire 20th century, 6.25% dead from wars. Uh, World War II claimed 17 million soldiers, but it also took the lives of 34 million civilians, twice as many civilians as, as uh, combatants. Um, the, um, uh, in today's wars, uh, it's been estimated that 75% of those who die are actually not soldiers, but civilians, women, women, men, children, the elderly, the poor. The U.S. is the leading purveyor of war in today's world. It's our biggest export. According to U.S. Navy historians, from 1776 through 2006, uh, U.S. troops fought in 234 foreign wars. Between 1945 and 2014, the U.S. launched 81% of all of the world's 248 major conflicts. Since the uh, Pentagon's retreat from Vietnam in 1973, U.S. forces have targeted Afghanistan, Angola, Argentina, Bosnia, Cambodia, El Salvador, Grenada, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Nicaragua, Pakistan, Panama, the Philippines, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, and the former Yugoslavia. Wars against nature have a long history. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the world's oldest tales, uh, we, see, we read the story of a Mesopotamian warrior and his quest to kill Humbaba a monster that reigned over the sacred cedar forest. Uh, in fact, Humbaba was also the servant of Enlil, the god of earth, wind, and air. But that didn't stop Gilgamesh from his quest. He went ahead and he killed the proprietor of uh, the protector of nature and wound up felling the cedars. In the Bible, uh, the book of Judges uh, relates an unusual scorched earth tactic that was used on the Philippines when Samson caught 300 foxes, and he tied them together tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Phil Philistines. During the Peloponnesian War, King Archidamus began an attack on Palatea by felling all of the fruit trees around the town. In 1346, the Mongol Tartars employed biological warfare to attack the Black Sea town of Kaffa, they catapulted bodies of plague victims over the fortified walls. 
The poisoning of water supplies, the destroying of crops and livestock are a proven means of subduing a population. Even today, these scorched earth tactics remain a preferred way of dealing with the agrarian societies of the global south. During the American Revolution, George Washington employed scorched earth tactics against the Native Americans who allied with the British forces. The fruit orchards and the corn crops of the Iroquois nation were uh, uh, destroyed in hopes that uh, the Iroquois themselves would perish over the course of a desperate cold winter. During the American Civil War, General Sherman's march to, march to Georgia and General Sheridan's campaigns against in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley were two more examples of these scorched earth assaults aimed at destroying civilian crops, livestock, and property. Sherman's army devastated 10 million acres of land in Georgia while Shenandoah's farmlands were turned into fire-blackened landscapes. And during the horrors of uh, the First World War, some of the um, Worst environmental impacts occurred in France during the Battle of the Somme, where 57,000 British troops died on the first day of combat alone. The high wood was left a burnt tumble of blasted mangled trunks. In Poland, German troops leveled forests to provide timber for military construction. And in the process, they managed to destroy the habitat of the Wisnet, which is uh, a European bison. Uh, they were, uh, uh, there were very few left after their habitat was uh, destroyed. Those that uh, did manage to survive were quickly cut down by the rifles of hungry German troops. One survivor of uh, the battlefield uh, experience described the landscape as a dumb blackened stump of shattered trees um, which still stick up where villages used to stand. Flayed by splinters of bursting shells, they now stand like corpses upright. A century after the carnage of World War I, Belgian farmers are still unearthing the bones of soldiers who bled to death in Flanders Field. World War I inflicted damage inside the US as well. To feed the war effort, 40 million acres were rushed into cultivation on acreage that was largely unsuited for agriculture. Lakes, reservoirs, wetlands were all drained to create farmland. Native grasses were replaced with wheat fields. Forests were clear cut to serve wartime needs. Extensive overplanting of cotton in the south uh, depleted soils that eventually succumbed to drought and erosion. But the biggest impact of World War I came with the uh, invention of oil fueled mechanization. Suddenly, modern armies no longer needed hay and oats for horses and mules. And by the end of World War I, General Motors had built nearly 9,000 army vehicles and turned a tidy profit in the process. Air power would prove to be another historic game changer. Now, with the outbreak of World War II, the European countryside was subjected to a renewed onslaught. German troops flooded 17% of Holland's lowland farms with salt water. Allied bombers breached two dams in Germany's Ruhr Valley, destroying 7,500 acres of German farmland. Meanwhile, in Norway, Hitler's retreating troops methodically destroyed buildings, roads, crops, forests, water supplies, and wildlife. 50% of Norway's reindeer were killed. Even 50 years after the end of that war, bombs, artillery shells, and mines are still being recovered from the fields and waterways of France and elsewhere. Millions of acres still remain off limits because of the so-called iron harvest, the buried ordinance that still uh, claims occasional civilian victims. But World War II's most destructive event involved the detonation of two nuclear bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The fireballs were followed by a black rain that pelted survivors for days, leaving behind an invisible mist of radiation that seeped into water and air, leaving a chilling legacy of cancers and mutations in plants, animals, and in newborn children. Before the nuclear test ban treaty was finally signed in 1963, the US and the USSR together had unleashed 1,352 underground nuclear blasts 520 atmospheric detonations and eight subsea explosions and a couple in near space, uh, equal to the force of 36,400 Hiroshima-grade bombs. <laughs> 
In 2002, the National Cancer Institute warned that everyone on Earth had been exposed to fallout levels from these uh, atmospheric explosions, and they had already at that point caused tens of thousands of cancer deaths. In the closing decades of the 20th century, the military horror show is unrelenting. For 37 months, in the early 1950s, the United States pounded North Korea with 635,000 tons of bombs and 32,557 tons of napalm. The U.S. destroyed 78 Korean cities, 5,000 schools, 1,000 hospitals, 600,000 homes, and killed as, perhaps as many as 9 million people, which would be 30 percent of the, of the population by some estimates. So Pyongyang has good reason to fear the U.S. In 1991, the U.S. dropped 88,000 tons of bombs on Iraq, destroying homes, power plants, major dam dams, water supplies, triggering a health emergency that contributed to the deaths of half a million Iraqi children. Smoke from Kuwait's burning oil fields turned, night, turned day to night and released vast plumes of toxic soot that drifted downwind for hundreds of miles. From 1992 to 2007, U.S. bombing helped destroy 38% of the forest habitat in Afghanistan. In 1999, NATO's bombing of a petrochemical plant in Yugoslavia sent clouds of deadly chemicals into the sky and released tons of pollution into nearby rivers. Africa's Rwandan war drove nearly 750,000 people into the Virunga National Park. 105 square miles were ransacked and 35 square miles were stripped bare. In Sudan, feeding soldiers, fleeing soldiers and civilians spilled into Garamba National Park, decimating the animal population. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, armed conflict reduced the resident elephant population from 22,000 to a mere 5,000. During the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Pentagon spread more than 1,000 tons of radioactive depleted uranium over the land, triggering an epidemic of cancers and a generation of horrifically deformed children in Fallujah and other cities. When asked what triggered the Iraq war, former CENTCOM Commander General John Ebizade was quite candid. He admitted, of course, it's about oil. We can't really deny that. And here's the awful truth. The Pentagon needs to fight wars for oil, to fight wars for oil. The Pentagon measures fuel in gallons per mile and barrels per hour, and the amount of oil burned increases whenever the Pentagon goes to war. At its peak, the Iraq war generated more than three million metric tons of global warming carbon dioxide per month. Now here's an unseen headline. Military pollution is a major factor driving climate change. And here's an irony. The military's scorched earth tactics have now become so devastating that we find ourselves living today literally on a scorched earth. Industrial pollution and military operations have driven temperatures to the tipping point. In the pursuit of profit and power, extractive corporations and imperial armies have effectively declared war on the biosphere. And now the planet is fighting back, striking back with an onslaught of extreme weather. But an insurgent Earth is like no other force a human army has ever faced. A single hurricane, for example, can unleash a punch equal to the detonation of 10,000 atomic bombs. Hurricane Harvey's airstrike on Texas caused $180 billion in damage. Hurricane Irma's tab could top, top 250 billion, and the toll for Maria is still growing. Now, speaking of money, the World Watch Institute has reported that if we redirected just 15% of the funds spent on weapons globally, we could eradicate most of the causes of war and environmental destruction. So why does war persist? Because the U.S. has become a corporate militocracy, controlled by the arms industry and fossil fuel interests. As former Congress member Ron Paul notes, military spending mainly benefits a thin layer of well-connected and well-paid elites. The elites are terrified that peace may finally break out, which will be bad for profits. 
It's worth recalling that the modern environmental movement arose in part in response to the horrors of the Vietnam War, Agent Orange napalm carpet bombing, and Greenpeace got its start protesting a planned nuclear test near Alaska. In fact, the name Greenpeace was chosen because it combined the two great issues of our time, the survival of the environment and peace on the world. So today our survival is threatened by gun barrels and oil barrels. To stabilize our climate, we need to stop wasting money on war. We can't win a war directed against the very planet we live on. We need to put down our weapons of war and plunder, negotiate an honorable surrender, and sign a lasting peace treaty with the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Gar. Our next speaker is Richard Tucker. Richard, <clears throat> excuse me, Richard is an environmental historian at the University of Michigan. He specializes on the world history of environmental impacts of war and militarism. He hosts the website environmentandwar.com, and he has been a peace and environmental activist since the Vietnam War years. Please welcome Richard. just got a note here, and, and you probably have heard this if you've been here very, very long at all. Please, if you're on the end, could you move, could the people on the very ends move in towards the center so that when we, the latecomers come, they won't have to climb over you and disrupt the speaker and disrupt everyone. So if you, if you don't mind, please move in if you're on the aisle. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leah, and good morning, friends. It's one of those special occasions when the first time you meet someone, it always already feels like a reunion. Uh, there's, there's a wonderful quality to this. Nothing like this conference, this convergence, has happened before. I'm so grateful to the organizers, and I'm tremendously impressed at the, at the range of speakers and organizers who are working together this weekend and beyond. Gar and I had not worked together previously, but you'll see how his approach and my approach are, I think, almost uncannily similar or complementary, and we'll go into that more as we move along. I want to recommend a book that I've been hoping would someone would publish for a decade and more, and that's The War and Environment Reader, which will be in press or in bookstores within a month, and I hope you'll all have copies of it as soon as it's available. It is the single best collection of material on this subject, past and present, that, we've, that any of us has achieved so far. And the introductory essay that Gar, who's, as most of you know, is one of our finest environmental journalists anywhere over the last 40 years and more. The introductory essay survey there is, I guarantee, the most effective, the most compelling that, we, that anyone has written yet. So thank you so much. The connections between military operations in our stressed biosphere are many faceted and pervasive, so there's work for us to do in many areas. One is the educational system. I'm an environmental historian by trade, as Leah has said. As a researcher and teacher, I've been working for 20 years on the military dimension of environmental decline. As Gar has highlighted, it's an old story. It's as old as organized human societies. But in our educational system, the many-sided connections between warfare and its environmental costs hardly show up at any level. <clears throat> 
Environmental historians paid little attention to these connections until our war and environment network emerged less than a decade ago. Most of us didn't want to study military history. Military historians, in contrast, have always paid attention to the national world, natural world, as settings and shapers of military operations and mass conflict, but their work has rarely discussed the long environmental legacies of military operations. Many peace studies programs could be enriched also by more attention to the environmental dimensions. Thanks to Tony Jenkins, we'll hear more from, from you on, and on that before this weekend is over. The more we're all aware of the impacts, both immediate and long-term, of these conflicts, the more we're going to be compelling in the message we give to anyone who's willing to listen. Military priorities for both defense and offense have been foremost for almost every society and state system through history. Those priorities have shaped political organizations, economic systems, and societies. There have always been, always been arms races managed by the state and produced by the military industry's workforce. But in the, and we must never neglect the labor and the labor force that's part of this, one of the great links of it, which we tend to overlook, I think. In the 20th century, the distortions of entire economies have been unprecedented in scale. We live now in the warfare state that was created in World War II and sustained by the Cold War. Our 10-author book on the environmental history of the Second World War in the U.S. will be out next year, and it probes the whole issue of the, of the warfare state as environmental warfare state. Looking back into our longer history, I want to highlight the tangled situation, particularly of civilians in wartime. Civilians as both victims and supporters of military operations. Here's where we find many critical connections between people's lives and environmental damage in both wartime and peacetime. One central link is food and agriculture. Farm populations have regularly suffered severely in wartime as military columns sweep across the land, requisitioning supplies, burning buildings, destroying crops, and damaging landscapes. These campaigns escalated with the coming of industrial warfare in the 19th century. The American Civil War is an obvious example. Scorched earth campaigns also produced agricultural disruptions and severe mal civilian malnutrition in almost every region of Europe in the Middle East in World War I. And we have another volume on the global environmental history of World War I that's coming out about 11 months from now in time for the centennial of the Versailles Conference. Speaking of scorched earth campaigns, let's consider deliberate environmental war just a bit more. Counterinsurgency campaigns designed to cripple civilian support of insurgents have repeatedly caused deliberate environmental damage. The use of chemical weapons in Vietnam was derived in part from colonial war strategies of the British and the French, who in turn had studied American strategy in the conquest of the Philippines around 1900. So the tradition goes back with clear military strategy. Uh, remembering its past, it goes way back through history, at least to ancient Greece. Many wartime upheavals have caused mass refugee movements. In modern times, they're usually well reported, except for the environmental dimension. Environmental stress intensifies wherever people are forced to leave, and also along their escape routes, and also where they land and have to struggle for survival. 
in our newly published multi-author volume, A Global Environmental History of the Second World War. One case that uh, we go into in detail is China during World War II, where tens of millions of refugees moved across the land through China with massive environmental disruption between 1937 and 1949. Let me turn for a moment to civil wars, which blur distinctions between civilians and, and combatants. Environmental damage has been a factor in every one of them. However, over the past century, not one was merely internal. All of them have been fed by the international arms trade. The environmental links to resource wars and the machinations of industrial powers in fighting to control strategic resources should be obvious. This is environmental warfare in many ways. These neo-imperial wars that use local people as surrogates are environmental conflicts. Thanks to Michael Clare, Philippe Le Billon in Vancouver, and others for their important work on resource wars. So when we study the more than 50, quote, civil wars of the past century, we must never ignore the global weapons market. And we can turn to CIPRI, the Swedish International Peace Research Institute in Stockholm, for the finest and most systematic tracking of the international arms trade, as I'm sure a lot of us in this room do. Here I want to change my tone for, for a minute to consider a somewhat more encouraging topic. Sometimes there have been heartwarming stories of victims working together in resilience, in situations that link militarized economies with public health crises, and we'll hear from Dale about one of the most important of these in just a minute, and produce citizens' environmental action. In several Soviet republics, in the glasnost Perestroika era that followed the Chernobyl disaster after 1986, Grassroots organizations emerged overnight when Gorbachev opened the window for public debate. By 1989, neighbors could publicly organize to protest toxic and radioactive diseases and link them very quickly to broader environmental issues. A new study from Kiev will soon tell that story specifically for Ukraine, where NGOs organized quickly, linked immediately to international organizations such as Greenpeace and to their own expatriates in Canada, the US, and Western Europe. Of course, movements like that are so difficult to sustain with the initial energy and hopefulness. In contrast with them, when a regime discourages its people from international connections, as is happening now in Hungary, environmental action is made more difficult. Finally, we come to the environmental deterioration that merges all the rest, climate change. The military's contribution to global warming has a history, but it hasn't yet been studied systematically. Barry Sanders' powerful book, The Green Zone, I'm glad oh, it was mentioned last evening, is an important example of very careful work on this. Military planners in the US, NATO countries, <coughs> India, China, Australia, are working hard on today's reality. <coughs> But the full history of the fossil fuel era can't be understood adequately until we see more clearly what the military segment has been, both in consuming fossil fuels and in shaping the global political economy of coal, oil, and natural gas. That's work that is in the works and it's coming along too slowly, frankly. So how do we move forward into the times ahead? That's why we're here this weekend. Resilience and recovery are also important parts of the historical record. Human and environmental damage has often been repaired, at least partially. I haven't said much about that discussion of that dimension of our history, resilience, repair, 
It deserves much more attention than we environmental historians and we older generation attempting to encourage younger generation to join the work. It's, there's much more to it than is generally available to us. It's an important part of our agenda, I think, in the classroom and also uh, in the broader public sphere. Our, our historical projects website, environmentandwar.com, is being revised and expanded this season. We, we hope that the site will be increasingly useful for campaigners and not just the researchers on campuses and in think tanks. I welcome suggestions of how to do that. And, I, and please alert me to other publications that should be listed for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Our third speaker is Dale Dewar. She is a Canadian rural family physician and jack of all trades and master of many, she says. Uh, former CEO for Physicians of Global Survival, which is the Canadian affiliate of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War. She's the author of From Hiroshima to Fukushima to You, facilitator of medical projects in Iraq, Pakistan, and southern Philippines, and just completed a clinical contract with the Nunavut, am I pronouncing that right, in the high Arctic. She lives in a passive solar house in rural Saskatchewan. Please welcome Dale. Thank you so much, uh, Leah, and to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I planned to come to the conference and then was suddenly asked if I would take the microphone. I would like to pay my respects to the Piscataway, who are where apparently the First Nations of this uh, territory on which we stand today. <clears throat> As I was packing and preparing to come, and I should have probably paid a little more attention to the temperatures. Um, I, my daughter phoned, uh, having arrived back in Calgary, Alberta, from a music extravaganza in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, she's a um, double bass player, big stand-up bass, uh, formerly a uh, classical player who transitioned to uh, playing backup bass for everything from rock bands to uh, folk singers and was uh, accompanying two bands that she frequently plays with. And uh, she had been a little nervous about coming south of 49. Why would she be nervous? She's a pacifist, ardent, and can't keep her mouth shut. She's a feminist. She's a Quaker, and she's an openly active lesbian. She phoned me and said, Mom, it was amazing. True, I'm a white girl, and I play a musical instrument, but people are wonderful. I felt so much love in the air, so much respect for one another and our differences, so much caring. People in the workshops were politically astute, even in the country western workshops. They are just like us. The elites that control the media create the divisions. Now, I had to look this up to find out who in fact said it first, uh, but I think that the phrase that keeps ringing in my mind is change the story, change the future. And it seems to be attributed to David Corton, who is an economist. Um, but on our bus trip yesterday around uh, central Washington, we were struck with the story being told in Washington of war, warmongers, heroes, there's no women, women's history isn't there, black history isn't there, First Nations history is not there, it is white male domination history. 